I moved to California in May. Having lived in Utah for most of my life, this was obviously a big change for me. Where I'm from, it's fairly safe. You can walk home at night and not have to worry about a thing. Everyone warned me how dangerous this new area can be, and to always be vigilant. I carry pepper spray with me at all times. I'd never really had any issues though, that is, until tonight. I ride the fast transit train system often, usually at least a few times a week. To get there from my apartment, I have to walk about a mile, most of which is an enclosed trail that runs behind the neighborhood next to the train tracks. There's one entrance at one end, one in the middle, and one at the other end which opens up to the train station parking lot. Last week, as I was walking home around 10 p.m., I had to walk past a man who was pretty obviously homeless. It seemed like he was searching for something he had lost and talking to himself as well. I had to walk past him to get home. I tried to put my head down and quickly walk past without him noticing. As I did so though, he blocked my way immediately. Excuse me, hey you, did you see a thing about this big? He gestured with his hands. Did you see it when you were walking through here? Confused, I told him no and hurried to walk away. I could hear him trying to say something further to me, but I kept on going. Luckily, he did not follow. A few days later though, I encountered him again on the same trail. He tried to stop me once more, but I simply told him, sorry, I don't know what you're looking for. I kept on going. Tonight, though, as I walked to the train station, he was coming out of the elevator as I was going down the escalator. He started yelling at me. Excuse me! Hey, you! Ma'am! I ignored him, but he followed and wouldn't leave me alone. I turned around frustrated and finally asked him what he wanted. Hey, did you see my speaker? You know, since you were on the trail that night? I told him no, and I didn't have any idea what he was talking about. But why don't you just let me look in your backpack real quick, cause you're looking real guilty right now. Obviously, I told him no. He got furious and took a step towards me. I pulled out my pepper spray. You better leave me alone. I will spray you. He started screaming about how he didn't care and how I better not have any of his shit. Still though, he walked away in the end. I walked to the far end of the platform and called my roommate to inform her about what was happening. All of a sudden, the guy comes rushing back to me, clearly holding a hatchet he was trying to poorly hide under his jacket. I grabbed my pepper spray once more. I told him to back the fuck away, because I was not playing around. He shoved his hatchet back into his jacket and started backing away. My roommate called the transit police for me. I could still hear the guy screaming from somewhere upstairs in the station. Luckily, my train pulled up right then, and I hopped on without further incident. I'm hoping I never meet that hatchet guy again. I never learned what fucking speaker he was talking about either. This happened in what I'd like to say was 2017 or so. I was around 13, and I was walking home from school. My mom worked late at the time, and my father was out on a business trip. My brother's college was farther away too, so he always came home half an hour to an hour later than me. When I had to go home by myself, I would always take this shortcut there, it was an enclosed path which rarely any people used. As I walked down this day, there was a man a few steps behind me. Since I was a young, dumb child, I didn't really think anything of it. When the enclosed path ended and connected to the sidewalk, I saw the man climb into a white van. Getting slightly suspicious now, I started running over to my house, only to notice the van was now following me. To be sure it was following me and I wasn't just being paranoid, I took a couple of wrong turns, but the van stuck right behind me. 
I took a detour, and when I thought I lost him, I ran back to my house and locked all my doors and windows once inside. I looked back out the window, and I saw the white van lingering. I frantically called my mother and my brother. My mom wouldn't be home for another few hours, and my brother had another half hour left. My mom told me to go to my parents' room and grab the gun. I went into my parents' room and went to their closet. I had to take it out of the lockbox. Mind you, the closest thing I'd ever done to shooting was archery. Prepared with this gun, I now went downstairs. I grabbed a knife as well, just in case. I went over to the window, only to see a man trying to peek inside. I pointed the gun directly at him and told him that if he did not leave right now, I would shoot him. He turned around and ran away. My brother finally came home a short time after. I told him what happened. We looked over the security camera footage and saw the man trying to get in through the back door, then giving up and coming to the window to try and find another way in. After my mom came home, we called the cops and they tried to trace his license plate number. I would see that same white van passing by my house every day until the police actually finally caught him. It turned out he was an escaped convict who was high on something. Good morning, my name is Antoine and I'm 32 years old. I prefer to apologize in advance if I make any mistakes, as English is not my first language. This story happened in 2021. I'll give you some context first. It was a Sunday and I had a date with a young woman who I had been seeing for a few weeks now. It was going pretty well. Spoiler alert, it ended quite quickly after this. Despite the restrictions going on at the time, we shared quite a bit of time around Paris. Going to restaurants, bars, cinemas, all of which were closed, we would just meet up outside of them. We were on the banks of the Seine when we decided to sit down a bit. We saw a free bench. We stayed there for about half an hour. A woman of about 50 years old who was sitting on the next bench over came towards us and told me that a girl behind us had been staring at me ever since we'd sat down. Curious, I turned around and looked for said girl. She must have been in her early 20s. She looked at me with a big grin on her face, not even blinking at all. She had faded red hair. This detail really stood out to me, because women with red hair really make me melt. Well, this particular woman was making me more uncomfortable. I laughed about it with my date and we decided to resume our walk. Hand in hand, we moved forward slowly and I made her laugh by talking about random stupid things. I felt something was wrong though. My date shook my hand worriedly, telling me that the girl was still following us. Pretending not to have noticed, I discreetly looked behind me. Indeed, this stranger was right there, following us only 10 meters away. Worried, we quickened our pace, but it seemed this girl was not going to allow a distance to establish itself. Arriving near the Alma Bridge, we started running up and trying to lose her. Still hurrying, we crossed. We were about halfway through when I turned around. I could still see the red-haired stranger following us from a distance away. We hurried to the metro to return to St. Lazare. I don't think I need to tell you that she got on the exact same train as us. I reassured my date, telling her that it was me she was looking at, and that she probably had some problem with me. I'm a fairly large person. I told myself that if it came down to it, I could defend myself from this girl easily. I got out of the train car, and the stranger did the same. I hurried onward thinking I could lose her, but she was really sticking to me. My date was still worried, so I lied by telling her I had lost the girl. Emily, if you're reading this, I'm sorry. I didn't want to worry you even more than you already were. 
By some bit of luck, we managed to get rid of my pursuant at the train platforms. We got into another car and sat at the doors that opened on the right side. A bit of a habit of mine. Putting on my headphones and music, I took a look at the other people sitting on this new train. To my surprise, I could see my pursuer right there. Somehow, she had gotten on the train and sat only a few seats in front of me without me even noticing. It appeared she hadn't noticed me either. I prayed with everything I could so that she wouldn't see me. I have legendarily bad luck though. She noticed me as soon as I noticed her, and I saw the corners of her lips twitch with a smile. What really freaked me out was she was crying. I tried not to look at her the whole way, but I could feel her eyes boring into me. I was asking myself every question imaginable. What does this girl want from me? Why is she smiling at me like that? Why is she not even trying to talk to me? Maybe she's just creepy but shy. I finally arrived at my station and had the idea of rushing off when the doors were about to close. That's exactly what I did. I almost got crushed during this action. I turned around and saw the girl was now banging on the windows of the doors, screaming in anger. Her angry cries will remain in my mind forever. I wondered what the other users of the train thought at that moment. Now I was pretty reassured. I had finally gotten rid of this stranger. My date had went back to her own place a while ago. I was finally going to be able to go back to my own home. It was now 8pm though and I was starting to get pretty hungry. I stopped at the McDonald's next to the station. It was a Sunday evening so there were a good amount of people there. I left 20 minutes later, having had a nice meal. Living with my parents since a difficult breakup previous, I was returning home to other people as well. Another detail at this time of year. A renovation was underway on the building where my parents and I resided, which meant a scaffolding was attached to the outside. I spent my time in the evenings in geek mode, playing games with friends. Since it was hot this night, I opened the blinds and the window about 30 centimeters to circulate some air inside. It was around 1am now. I turned everything off and put on my boxers to go to bed. At that very moment, I turned and noticed the girl's face peeking in through the openings of my blinds. Fortunately, the guardrail was preventing her from entering. I lived on the second floor, which meant she had climbed up the scaffolding to watch me for I don't know how long. At that moment, I grabbed my KSG-12 airsoft rifle from my cupboard. It looks very realistic to the untrained eye. I put a dummy cartridge in where we'd normally put the pellets. I pointed it at the girl in fear. I told myself that she would leave after seeing this, but instead she started to cry. It's me, my love. Don't you recognize me? Let me in. My mother came into the room in a panic, and I ordered her to call the police, which she did right away. They came very quickly and arrested the young woman, who was screaming how much she loved me. Needless to say, I took a lot of pressure from the cops for my response. It was an airsoft rifle, but all the same. It was still understandable in this kind of situation to me, though. I couldn't sleep all night long. I bought a fan the next day and made sure my blinds and windows remained closed for a while. I went to the police to find out if I could file a complaint too. I did it for attempted home invasion, aggravated variety. About a week later, I received a call from a psychiatrist giving me an appointment at a psych clinic in Paris. I went there on the indicated day. Arriving in the practitioner's office, he explained to me that he had my contact details. They were from the report of the complaint he'd received about the young woman. I learned why soon after. She was in this institute. Her ex-boyfriend had apparently cheated on her, and she completely lost her mind when she found out and stabbed him. According to the psychiatrist, I looked almost exactly like her ex. The doctor took me to the common room, and I saw the girl. We sat next to her and the psychiatrist asked her if she knew me. She directly answered no, without a smile on her face, indifference personified. 
I admit that this actually kind of reassured me. The psychiatrist told me the complaint had been added to the girl's file, and it would extend her internment. I admit I felt a bit bad for her at that moment. I almost wanted to withdraw my complaint. For the safety of my parents and myself, though, I did not do so. Since then, I always sleep with my KSG-12 right next to my bed. I've had no further news since. It might be stupid of me to say, but I really do hope the girl gets better, only that she stays as far away from me as possible as well. I've had a lot of trouble getting to sleep since this event, but I haven't had any further psychological concerns. It sure is relieving to talk about, though. So it was a Thursday afternoon. At the time, I was in fourth grade, in a private Catholic college, although I suppose that's not that important a detail. This school was not very far from home, which was a residence with several neighbors around. On the day of this incident, we were studying. In the study, it was a bit of a mess. Everyone was talking, and we had been warned several times that if we continued being so loud, the supervisor would keep us until 5 p.m. instead of releasing us at 4.20. Because of a group of troublesome students in our class, we were of course kept until 5 p.m. Note that unlike me, almost all of the other people in my class went home by bus, I had to either take the town path or go down a slope that led to the residences, and this was an area where not many people passed by. That evening, as I often did, I took the slope because it was way faster. I put my music in my ears and started my walk. Everything was fine so far. I almost had a heart attack, though, when I suddenly felt someone grab my hand from behind. I turned my head and, to my surprise, I saw there was a little girl, about eight or nine years old. She had a school bag on her back. She looked just like any other normal little girl you'd see coming home from school, except she kept my hand in hers and was walking as if nothing had happened, not saying a single word to me. I was already a bit perplexed because I didn't know this girl at all. She squeezed my hand really hard and seemed very tense. I was starting to have a very bad feeling. Even if it did seem a little weird to me, I told myself maybe she's confusing me with someone else she knows. I was about to turn and ask her what she wanted and why she was holding on to me when I heard footsteps coming from right behind us. There was a male voice calling out to me. Instinctively, I turned around and saw a man who introduced himself in a rather polite manner. He told me he was the father of the little girl and he was sorry for any inconvenience she may have caused me. As naive as I can be, I didn't answer. I quickly realized a disturbing detail. These two did not look anything alike. Not hair color, not eye color, not facial structure, nothing at all. The little girl was black, had black hair and brown eyes, and this man was extremely pale-skinned, and his eyes and hair were very light colors, not a single feature matching, in short, the perfect opposite almost. I told myself that perhaps there were a thousand and one reasons why they wouldn't look alike. Genetics aren't exactly perfect, and it was also none of my business. I turned to the little girl to ask her more, but she looked completely paralyzed with fear. All I knew was that this girl clearly didn't like this guy. This girl is my little sister. Who are you? I almost regretted saying that the instant it left my mouth. After all, what if the guy really was her father? It would be super humiliating, and I might get in trouble. On the other hand, if it turned out he wasn't, it would be really bad for me to just let her go without doing anything. Without lying, that was the most intense moment of my entire life. I was so freaked out I even missed the code once before finally being able to enter my residence and slamming the door right in the guy's face. I took the little girl inside with me. He tried to extend his arm out to stop the door, 
we were already inside, so I didn't see if he did or not. I sprinted through the garden as I always did, but this time not to go home, but to go to a hall leading to a large building with other houses in it that I lived right next door to. The reason was fairly simple. I knew one of the people there living on the second floor. He was a police officer. He would be able to fight this guy if he came after us. I strongly thought that if he was not there at that moment, we were going to be in some serious trouble. Luckily, he was home. We called the police, and he waited for the man armed with his taser. After 20 minutes, though, the man still had not arrived. I guess the door had closed on him after all. I found out afterward that apparently this person was well known to the police for pedophilia and is now behind bars. Regarding the young girl, apparently she was unable to speak, which is why she didn't say a word to me. I can only imagine how scared she felt in that moment. I now take the city route home because it's more populated and less isolated. That's the end of my story, so I hoped you liked it. My wife and I were coming home late from dinner and drinks at a friend's house. We were in the country outside of Union, Missouri, on the south side of Union. There was an antique bridge there that was quite scary to cross because it was so narrow and had a sharp turn at one end just after the bridge ended. The road went through a huge field, which at the time was under cultivation. I really had to go to the bathroom in the worst way because of all the beer I drank that night. My wife suggested I stop and go down to that field. There was an old shed right in the middle, and you could squat down by the shed to use the bathroom. She stopped the car right in the road. Because it was late and so very dark, I got out and started to walk towards that shed, which was only a couple feet off the road. Suddenly, I saw something. It didn't register right away what I was looking at. It took me a couple of seconds to realize what it was. I saw two eyes, big glowing red eyes that were looking right at me from the darkness. I turned to see my wife looking over her shoulder at them too, confirming that I really was seeing this. It's kind of funny to think about now, but neither one of us said a single word. I just turned around and jumped right back in the car. We took off driving. My wife asked me what kind of animal I thought that was. I'm an old country boy, but I had never seen eyes shining like that before. The eyes were real big too, and high up, so it must have been a rare animal. I didn't know. The bridge has since been replaced with a new one, but that old shed is still there. Believe it or not, I still speed up whenever I go by it, because I'm still creeped out by whatever I saw that night all those years before. This happened last semester, when I was finishing the 10th grade. I'm a teenage girl with almost no enemies at all, which makes this story even weirder. I'm still a bit nervous to tell it, because of the person it involves. I just hope for the sake of my own life that it never gets back to them. This all began in my science class on the very first day when my teacher created the seating plan. Unfortunately, this was one of those teachers that didn't want you sitting with your friends. He believed this was a good way to get us to meet new people, but trust me when I say, there are some people you don't want to be meeting. My teacher sat me down next to a boy who I'd never seen before. His name was Al. Right away, I got some weird vibes from him, so I tried to focus on my worksheets and avoid conversation. Yes, I know that might sound a little bit rude, but it was a quiet class anyways. Not introducing yourself wasn't really out of the ordinary here. He seemed to be the type of person that didn't really have any social skills anyway, and seemed very awkward. He didn't appear to take very good care of himself either. Even though I was at least a foot or two away from him, I could smell his disgustingly bad breath. 
Apparently, I was not the only one who didn't want to introduce myself, because an awkward silence filled the entire room. My teacher noticed this, and stood up in front of the class. I know it may feel weird sitting beside a stranger, but it will feel a lot better if you get to know each other. I want you to turn to the person I seated you with, shake their hand, and tell them your name. Great. Now I had to talk to this guy. We introduced ourselves and shook hands. His hand was extremely sweaty, and the way he lingered during the handshake really creeped me out. Most people had brief conversations and then went back to their work immediately. That's what I was hoping for too, but of course that's not what happened. For about a minute things were quiet, but that entire time he was just staring at me. I looked over at him after a while, because it was a bit strange how he was just non-stop staring. I wanted him to knock it off. Before I could ask what he was doing though, he started to talk to me again. What kind of music do you like? He asked awkwardly. I told him what I listened to honestly. Then I returned the question. I didn't want to be rude if he was making an earnest effort. He said in the most monotone and serious voice ever, I freaking love Nicki Minaj. I love everything about her. She's just the most beautiful woman ever. At first, I chuckled a bit. I thought maybe he was exaggerating or something, but then I realized he was being dead serious. I was surprised. He didn't really seem like the kind of guy that would like her music. Apparently, he had even been to quite a few of her concerts. Later on, though, he admitted to me that he didn't like her music at all. He just liked looking at her body. I didn't really care that much, and that wasn't the creepiest part anyway. He started telling me about his other classes. He focused a lot on his Spanish class. I asked him why he liked Spanish so much. He stared me directly in the eyes. Miss Johnson is the hottest teacher I've ever seen. I love her so freaking much. I didn't know how to answer that really. I just kind of said, oh, that's cool. I heard she's nice. He responded in the creepiest way imaginable. Yeah, she's real thick. I like him thick. Mmm. This was really weird. This guy did not seem like someone whose bad side I wanted to get on at all though. Yeah, there are pretty good teachers at this school, I guess. I didn't think there was anything wrong with how I responded. I definitely didn't expect the reaction I got from him. He had some weird outburst. No, I hate Mr. Jones. He's a piece of crap, he said angrily. I had no idea what I'd said that would provoke him like that. This wasn't even who we'd been talking about. He was also a teacher who was one of the most well-liked teachers in our school. I didn't know anyone that didn't like him. Apparently, he taught Al for English last semester, and clearly, things did not go very well. I didn't ask why he hated him so much. I figured it might just be best to play along in this situation before he caused even more of a scene. I just said, yeah, he's my drama teacher. He doesn't seem all that great. The kid talked to me the entire class. I barely even got to say a word back to him. I was just giving one-word answers for most of his questions, yet he would not stop talking to me. It was getting kind of annoying. He was intimidating, so I didn't really do anything about it, though. I wanted him to shut up so I could do my work. How was I going to finish this shit? As the days went by, I realized just how weird this guy was. He started to tell me about all of his problems, as if I was his therapist. He didn't say a single word to anyone else in the class. I think he knew I was the only one who wouldn't call him out for being such a weirdo, because I was scared of him. I had to sit next to him for the rest of the year. I dreaded science every single day, because I hated listening to him. I never got any work done, and he would tell me the most personal and disgusting things about himself. He even showed me the foot fungus on his toe. He pulled out his phone and showed me many pictures. I was so grossed out. I still didn't want to make him mad, though. A few days later, he brought up Mr. Jones again randomly, that teacher who he apparently hated. I'd never heard someone more angry in my entire life. He leaned in to whisper to me, You know, I've planned on killing him, right? I want him dead. I wasn't afraid to do it. 
The only thing stopping me was the law, but one day I'll find a way around that. He said it with a terrifying blank stare in the most serious way a person could speak. I was pretty concerned, frankly. All I said was, you don't want to risk going to jail, man. I really wanted to tell a teacher or a counselor because something was extremely off inside this guy's head. I had no doubt he would actually do it. The thing was, if he got in trouble for making threats like that, he would immediately know it was me who told on him. Who knows what he'd do to me then? I knew he'd start coming for me right away. It would be way easier for him to kill me than a teacher anyway. I told my friends about him instead. It turns out that one of my friends knew the guy. She said he was a complete nutcase and that if he made a threat like that again, I should tell someone immediately. She agreed he wasn't even slightly joking when he said that. For the rest of the semester, he would ask me creepy questions and randomly swear under his breath. One time he asked me what my stripper name would be if I was a stripper. Just creepy random things about that. At one point, he even asked me if I was genuinely afraid of him. He really wanted me to like him. I was so afraid of being on his bad side, he had shown himself to be very violent and talked about revenge a lot. He had a very unpredictable short fuse, too. One day, we had to be lab partners, and for the lab, we were going to need a source of gas. I turned on the gas so we could use it. He started swearing and yelling at me, calling me stupid and saying I was wasting the gas. I told him I was sorry and asked if he wanted to be in charge instead. I didn't want the teacher to think I was the one causing problems. There was another incident where we were learning about the carbon cycle and how cows contributed to it. The teacher was trying to be funny and said something like, whenever I drive past a farm, I always make sure to plug my nose so I don't smell the cow poop. Out of nowhere, he just loudly blurted out, I inhale deeply. The rest of the class burst out laughing. I knew he was probably serious though. He didn't laugh at all because he was definitely being dead serious. For the next hour of our class, he told everyone about his poop fetish over and over. You have no idea how hard it was to keep a straight face while he was telling me that there was nothing he loved more than the smell of it. He even said he ate horse dung one time. It was all extremely hard to listen to. It began to get unbearable when he started to go into his personal habits as well. He said he liked playing with his own feces and how he would purposely touch other people's stuff after because it turned him on, knowing other people came into contact with it. After an hour of listening to him talk about this, I was getting really annoyed. I started being a little bit rude and sarcastic. I soon realized that was a big mistake though. He became really angry at me and started screaming. My classmates were now staring at me. I tried to calm him down before he made an even bigger scene. I lied and said I wasn't making fun of him. I actually thought it was a real cool thing. It took three whole minutes of apologizing and convincing before he finally calmed down. He started to get even creepier. He walked into class late one day and extremely pissed off. After the teacher's lesson was over, he started ranting to me like a maniac. I hate everyone in this stupid fucking school. I should come here with a gun and just blast everyone down, then take myself out after. I don't even care anymore. He said this with a piercing eye, staring directly at me. I was scared. Nobody in their right mind would say that to someone they barely know. I wanted to tell someone so badly, but I couldn't prove what he'd said. I didn't tell anyone except a few close friends. I tried to convince him otherwise that hurting anyone in our school would be a horrible idea, but that just resulted in him getting mad at me. I worried that if one more teacher made him mad, he really would act on his threat. He definitely fit the profile of a skirt with short, socially awkward loner, lack of compassion, poor judgment, not caring about the consequences of his actions. Every day I worried he might do it at any moment. Luckily, it's now summertime, and I'm out of school for a while, so I don't have to see that psycho again until September. I'm glad he didn't hurt anyone, though. He did harass and scare people in other ways. There are too many incidents to remember. I'll name a few just to be quick. 
that Spanish teacher who I mentioned earlier who he was showing interest in? Obviously, she was annoyed by his behavior in her class. I wasn't there to see it happen, but apparently he made some inappropriate comments to her during Spanish. She found out he was planning on taking her other class as well. I was told he was banned from taking classes with her. I can only assume she didn't allow him to take them because of his creepy behavior. Another time, he called over the class peer tutor who was male and one year older than us. He asked for help on a question but was not able to understand even after the tutor explained, so he got very angry at him. He threatened that if he brought his white ass anywhere near him again, he'd kill him. I found out a few days later. He'd called the peer tutor over and over again. I thought maybe he would try to apologize, but no. He looked him dead in the face and said he was going to off him. The peer tutor was really creeped out. Luckily, he just laughed and then left. Al stared at me like I was messing with him. He's the creepiest person I've ever met. Now you know how I unwittingly became the therapist of some weird psychopath who might attack our school one day. I just hope I don't have any classes with him ever again because I don't think I could handle it. I really hope he gets some help. A friend of mine told me the story of a girl she had met from Sweden who stayed with her for a while. The girl was in her mid-twenties and we'll call her Jane. Jane was driving to her mother's house one late evening. She lived far away from the city in a heavily forested area. There weren't really any street lights on this road because of this and not a lot of houses either. The few houses that were built were back into the forest and had long winding driveways so you couldn't really see them from the road. As she was driving along this road, something up ahead caught her eye. There appeared to be a small bundle on the side of the road. As her car passed by this bundle, she was shocked to see what looked like a baby wrapped up in a blanket just laying there. Jane slammed the brakes, stopping about 50 meters up the road. She reversed and jumped out of the car as quick as she could, thinking that someone had just abandoned their baby on the roadside. Jane ran over to the bundled up blanket and exhaled a sigh of relief when she realized it was just a toy. Just as she made to pick it up though, she saw headlights coming down the road in front of her. She suddenly realized that she was standing on the road alone at night in the middle of nowhere basically. She quickly ran back to her car and jumped in, then started the engine and drove off. The car behind her sped up, coming really close to the back of her car. It was honking its horn at her over and over. Jane was now panicking. She started driving faster and faster, constantly checking her rearview mirror. Although she couldn't see who was in the car behind her, she was still terrified. Eventually, she reached her mother's driveway, which was still about two miles long. Her mother lived deep into the forest, she thought to herself that if the car followed her down the driveway, she would call her mother and tell her to ring the police immediately. As you might imagine, as she turned into the driveway, the car continued to follow behind her, still very close. She kept thinking back to that baby toy and how creepy the evening had been. Jane got out her phone and called her mother. She told her that she was being followed and to call the police right now. She was expected to arrive in about five minutes. Both cars were going way too fast for that tiny, narrow dirt road. There were no street lights at all either. All that Jane could see was what was being lit up by her headlights and the headlights of her pursuer. She began to see her mother's house in the distance. The car behind her was still extremely close, blaring their horn so loudly that Jane's ears began to ring as she got to the house, she jumped out of the car. Her mother was already standing at the front door, waiting for her with a kitchen knife in hand. The car that was following her also stopped, and the car's doors flew open. An elderly couple got out of the car and started shouting and pointing at Jane's vehicle. Someone's in your car, they screamed. 
That's when Jane realized what really happened. The man inside jumped out of the back seat now having been discovered and ran off into the forest. Everyone just looked at each other in shock. The car that was coming down the road just happened to see someone jump into her vehicle when she'd stopped to check on the baby. It was likely the man had left it there on the road on purpose and was waiting for people to stop and take advantage of their kindness. As I said at the start of the story, a friend of mine told this to me secondhand. I believed it to be true though. If anyone else has heard of this, please leave a comment down below. Always remember to lock your doors whenever you leave your vehicle. You never know what you might need to be prepared for. This happened to my sister about 15 years ago when she was still in high school and I was in middle school. Our mom worked as a house cleaner and always became friends with the people whose homes she cleaned. One of those homes was owned by an elderly couple who had no kids but had a huge house with a really nice pool. They would always invite me and my siblings to come over swimming and have fun. The husband worked as a CEO of a large airline company, and they lived in a very nice neighborhood on a large lot surrounded by forests. When you were in their backyard, you couldn't see the other houses at all. Just trees all around. It felt very secluded. Their house was very angular and architecturally interesting, with multiple levels made from stone. Pretty much every room had these big floor-to-ceiling windows that looked out over the backyard and gave great views of the landscape during the day. At night, however, the reflection from the inside lights prevented you from seeing out. It was always a bit unnerving to walk by them, since you couldn't really see what was on the outside. The couple also liked to decorate with old Native American art and masks, which was a little bit creepy to a middle schooler. The couple themselves were very nice and not creepy at all though, so I never got really scared when I was over there. They had an older golden retriever named Samson that lived up to his name. He was massive but had a sweet and gentle temperament. They'd also rescued a husky mix named Sadie, who was the polar opposite. Psycho Sadie as we lovingly called her. She had intense separation anxiety and she would destroy their home whenever they left. She would also jump their short fence and go wild if they let her outside. If they took her with them to run errands, she would destroy their car while they were inside the store. She would howl non-stop until they returned. Since they were wealthy and had the extra money to do so, they would pay me and my sister to come over and dog sit for them. While they went out, we got 20 bucks an hour, so we were always excited to go over there, watch cable, swim in their awesome pool. Normally, everything would be fine. Both dogs would usually just kind of lay around and do nothing. Occasionally, Sadie would realize I was a stranger and go nuts and start barking at me. I would literally watch her eyes turn red. I was almost convinced she was going to attack me. She would always calm down, though, after I got up on the couch. I digress. This particular incident happened over Easter weekend while the homeowners were out of town for two days. They were paying my sister to stay over there that weekend. I was going to be staying with her the first night because it was a big house and it was kind of scary to stay there all alone. We stayed up late watching movies and eating junk food. The next day we swam in their pool and hung out, but for some reason I decided not to spend the night again. I'm kind of glad I didn't because what happened that night scarred my sister for life. It all started when my sister was working out on their treadmill in their workout room. Their workout room was on the bottom floor of their home, which was a walkout basement. Just outside the room was a huge glass door that opened right to their patio and pool. She had the TV on in the workout room as she was running and was watching the TV when she thought she heard the house alarm beep like it did whenever the door was opened. She stopped on the treadmill and went to look around. 
she saw that the sliding glass door was opened. Now, this door was huge. There's no way it would have opened by itself. Instantly, she freaked out. However, the dogs were just lying there. She figured that if someone really had intruded, they would have gotten up to investigate. Especially because Sadie could get so crazy and hated strangers so much. She thought she might have just accidentally left the door open and just imagine the beep of the alarm. Maybe it could have come from the TV or the treadmill itself. She closed and locked the door and went back to working out. A couple of minutes later, though, she started to get the distinct feeling of someone watching her. She looked around, but no one seemed to be there. She finished her workout, but she couldn't shake that feeling of being watched. She decided to just go to bed, as she was becoming extremely creeped out. She wanted to try and forget about this feeling. She went around and made sure all the doors were locked. The owners didn't give her the alarm code, so she couldn't set it herself. She took a shower and locked herself in the guest bedroom with both dogs, just in case. Eventually, she fell asleep. A couple of hours later, though, she awoke to both dogs now growling at the door of the room. It was fairly normal for Psycho Sadie to growl and bark for no reason, but Samson had never shown such overt signs of aggression. Immediately, my sister knew something was wrong. She was shaking, trying to convince herself the dogs had just heard an animal and that it was all nothing. Then, though, she heard the dreadful door alarm beeping. She called my dad in a panic, crying and screaming. He told her to hang up and call the police, as he was on his way over right now. She called the cops and my dad made the 15-minute drive in just under 5 minutes. When she opened the bedroom door to let my dad inside the house, the dogs took off running and barking down to the basement. My sister ran screaming all the way through the house to the front door to let my dad in. He quickly took a look around with his gun, but he didn't see anything unusual. The police arrived a few minutes later and looked around the property. They found that the back gate was open, as well as the sliding glass door again. Not enough to let the dogs out though, just barely ajar, like someone had slammed it shut and it had bounced back open. They said it looked like someone had entered the home through that area because the lock had been tampered with. They determined that whoever this was had not stolen or disturbed anything. When my dad asked why someone would break in and not do anything, especially with the dogs locked up, the police said they had been notified by the homeowners earlier that month that the husband had received death threats because of a decision he made on the job. Apparently, it put a lot of people out of work. They had gone to the police about it, but didn't bother to tell my sister to keep an eye out for anything suspicious, since they didn't think anything would really happen. Needless to say, we never dog sat for them again, and they moved out of state within a few months because the husband lost his job. If you ask me, he kind of deserved it. I remember the apartment being very cold when we walked in. It was probably in the low 60s outside, but it somehow felt even colder in our one-bedroom domicile than it did in the drafty courtyard. I mentioned it to Ben, but he didn't even respond. He already had the game on and was complaining about the luck of the football team from some city across the country that he would never even go to. I decided I was going to warm up in the shower. I put the statement out there, 60% as a notification and 40% as an offer for Ben to join me. He responded with a sound that I'm not even sure qualifies as a grunt. I went on my own and let the shower warm up. Then I slipped in. I felt the grime of the workday, the after-work drinks we had to have with Ben's boss, and the chill of the night wash off me as soon as the stream of water hit my body. The first couple of minutes in the shower were utter bliss to me, one of those moments when you feel like nothing in life could ever be better. I never wanted to get out. Then though, I heard what sounded like someone peeing on the other side of the shower curtain. Ben, 
I said in a thoroughly annoyed tone. Please don't flush the toilet. I heard the urine stop. I didn't hear the toilet flush. I heard Ben walk out of the bathroom. I showered for another 10 minutes before I got out, dried off, and headed back to the bedroom. I glanced over at Ben still on the couch, glued to the same game. I heard him muttering something about a fumble or some sort of sports thing. Thanks for not flushing the toilet, I said before ducking into our bedroom. I didn't go into the bathroom, Ben said. I stopped in the doorway and then walked back into the living room. Don't lie, I heard you peeing when I was in the shower. Ben threw his hands up with his eyes still on the game. I haven't gotten up from my seat since we walked in. It's overtime, Ben insisted. His tone was the kind where I could tell he was telling the truth about something. The warmth of the hot shower now slithered off me in a second. Don't mess with me, I stated coldly to Ben. I swear I didn't go in there. I started to get an ominous feeling. I didn't know what to do. I stood there shivering in nothing but a towel. Ben rose to his feet and walked towards me. I watched his eyes scan the room with a fear in them I had never seen before. He stopped in the doorway and grabbed me, covered my mouth and perked his ears out. I didn't hear anything though, other than the ominous ring of a siren. We stood there for a few more moments. I heard nothing. The siren was also gone. Well, we would have heard something if someone was in here, Ben said. He reluctantly agreed to search the apartment anyway. We searched the place up and down and didn't find anything out of the usual. Finding nothing was actually worse though than finding a junkie with a bloody knife or some hideous monster under my bed or something. The mystery of the whole thing was worse than any nightmare I could have imagined. The next few weeks were pretty tense. I didn't want to stay in the apartment alone. Ben told me my brain must have just played a trick on me. It was just a bad thought, he said. There was no possible way someone could have been in there. It was not a good idea on his part to tell me that. I lost trust in him. What happened was definitely not in my head. I knew it. I got my confirmation a few weeks later, when I stood in the shower getting ready for work. I was almost done with the shower, when I heard a flush whirring from the other side of the shower curtain. I couldn't dodge the water in time, and took a stinging hot stream to the face. I screamed and opened the shower curtain. No one was there. I heard footsteps walking away from the open bathroom door though. I heard the front door unlock and then close again. I called out, my body cold despite the hot water pounding on my back. There was no answer. I covered up in a towel and walked into the bedroom. There was no sign of Ben around either. I checked out the living room where there was a handwritten note on the coffee table. I had to go to work early today, babe. Sorry. I called him up. He was clearly annoyed that I was calling him at work, yet he confirmed that he had not been there to flush the toilet when I was in the shower. He'd left far before I even got in. I listened to the space around me in the apartment. I didn't even know what Ben said after that point. Everything felt like it had fallen silent, but it felt like the entire apartment was alive around me. At that point, I ended the call with Ben. One thing was clear. Whoever had been sneaking around the bathroom while I was showering had some way to get in and out of our apartment. Either that or Ben was a severely fucked up guy and wanted to deeply disturb me for some reason, but I didn't think that was right. Ben continued to swear up and down that it was not him doing this. He brought up the idea of me inventing the whole thing in my head again. I offered a solution. What if we set up some cameras inside the apartment? I wanted to record the entire premises. Ben didn't want to spend that much money, so we settled on simply recording the front door and the bathroom. I reviewed the tapes each day at work. Weeks went by without so much as a hint of anyone doing anything at any moment of the day, let alone when I was in the shower. All I could see was Ben and I going about our daily lives, barely talking to each other, going back and forth to work. The fear that all of this was in fact in my head started to really bubble up. I felt some tension from Ben whenever he asked me about every other day if I had seen anything on the cameras yet. 
Our already strained relationship felt like it was hanging on by a single thread. We were barely talking now. It all came to a head when I reviewed the footage about a month after I set up the cameras. The footage from the bathroom proved fruitful finally. It was footage of while I was in the shower. I stopped the footage once I saw a shadow appear in the screen of the bathroom window. I stopped breathing as I watched the shadowy figure pull away the screen from the window, then slide into the room. The light wasn't very good in the bathroom. With me taking the shower after my nightly workout just around dusk, I hadn't turned on the bathroom light. However, I could see what looked to be a stout man in black pants, a hoodie, and wearing a white mask, standing in the bathroom right next to me as I was taking a shower. I couldn't believe it. I had always showered with the curtain closed at that point in time, and I hadn't seen the man through them. I hated myself almost as much as I was scared. As I watched the footage, those feelings burned in me as I watched the man just stand there watching me for a few seconds before heading over to the toilet. I heard the sound of the shower stopping on the video. I knew I would open the curtain at any second, and I wondered how in the hell I hadn't caught this man. What I watched next literally made me vomit a little bubble in the back of my throat. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The man reached down and stuck his fingers against the floor of our bathroom and yanked against the tiles. I watched as about half of the bathroom floor practically rose up about a foot off the ground with him holding it. The man slipped into the dark opening underneath. He seemed to disappear into the floor altogether before slowly easing the tiles back into the ground right when I opened the shower curtain. I watched myself get out of the shower, grab a towel, and head to the bedroom in real time. I fast-forwarded through the rest of the video until it ran out. The guy had never come out of that floor space, meaning he had been in there the entire night until I left for work the next day. Hell, he could still be in the apartment right now. One burning thought simmered in my mind when the realization washed over me. It was the day before Veterans Day, and Ben had the day off while I didn't. He was still at home, with that man possibly in the bathroom floor hiding. I scrambled to call Ben as soon as I could, but there was no answer. I called over and over, but there was no answer no matter how many times I tried. I called the cops and drove back home, without telling my boss anything. The cops were already there when I arrived. They busted down the door and found the apartment entirely empty. There was no one in that hollowed out section beneath the bathroom floor. Ben's cell phone was in the bedroom, but he was nowhere to be found. As the police searched outside, they found spikes stuck in the side of the building, which led all the way up from the alley behind our building to our third floor bathroom window. They looked to be the sort of spikes a mountain climber would use to climb a cliff or something. They believed he must have lived in one of the other tall apartment complexes nearby and had been spying on me. They believe he used the spikes to break in during the day over and over while the two of us were out at work and cut that hole in our bathroom floor, then dug out an area to create a hiding space a little bigger than himself where he could hide away when needed. They said he seemed to be incredibly skilled at what he did. Likely, he had been doing it to apartments all around the area if he was doing this much. The story of Ben was far more disturbing. The police found his car parked on a sidewalk a few blocks away, in its usual spot. His cell phone was right where he usually left it too, but he had vanished without a trace. I've since moved out of the apartment. Ben was never found. I moved a few cities over back to my parents' home to try and throw the scent off of whoever was doing this. The limited clues and leads the police possess have been shared over the past few months, but none of them seem to lead anywhere. All they have to go by is that they don't think that Ben had anything to do with the sneak-ins himself and that him and the masked assailant were unrelated. They don't know what to think about his disappearance. My cousins live in North Dakota, and I spent winter break at their place freshman year in college. 
We were at their friend's house one night, drinking in her basement with some other girls. It was getting really late, about 3 a.m. or so. I was falling asleep, so I decided to walk home. They live in a desolate area with lots of snow, and it gets really cold, especially at night. The houses weren't too far apart, though, and when the moon is out, it seems to light the outside path very well. The path we take is straight behind the house through some wooded areas, then some more open land. As I was shuffling home through the snow, with my head hung down low, I looked up to the left of my 10 o'clock. Probably around 75 yards away, I could see another figure walking in the opposite direction. I saw him a split second before he saw me. When he did, he kind of did an unnatural jerking motion in his arms and shoulders, obviously startled at the sight of me. I laughed out loud for some reason, maybe just the shock of seeing this or something. I gave him a little wave and said, Oh, he has startled me. You know, that kind of thing. The person just stood there, though, and started staring at me. I thought he was going to say something for a second, and so I stopped for a moment, just looking back at him. I could see he had a full-face ski mask on, and I could tell it was obviously a man. He was really tall. He didn't say anything, so it felt like forever. It was just me and this stranger in a ski mask looking at each other in the desolate woods in the middle of winter. At 3 a.m., a huge chill went down my spine, and a voice in the back of my head told me I needed to get the hell out of there right now. I turned and started walking as fast as I could the other direction. I've never been that scared in my life. I was drunk and stoned and very paranoid. I imagined me walking home from the opposite perspective, the man running up behind me with an axe and gutting me. I started sprinting as fast as I could, all the way back home, thinking this guy could easily follow my tracks in the snow, and I was probably going to die tonight. Luckily, that didn't happen, but I don't think I'll be visiting that area again anytime soon. I'm a 30-year-old transgender male. For the sake of my demeanor when this event occurred, I was a 19-year-old timid lesbian headed into the world immediately after graduation. I had just lost my job at McDonald's due to a massive flood taking out a lot of businesses in my area. I had a girlfriend that lived 30 minutes away, and I needed gas money to get to her, so I took a job offered to me by a family friend at a 24-7 gas station in the next town over from mine. The shift I was hired for was 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. I had never worked a night shift in my life, but I thought it would be pretty cool to have little to no pressure other than to make sure the coffee was ready at 4 a.m. for the morning regulars. I was required to train on day shift for the first couple of weeks to get accustomed to the usual operations Throughout those weeks, I learned many of the ins and outs of what takes place on the night shift. I also learned the ins and outs of the people that hung around these places for hours, and there were quite a few of them. One woman in particular, Melinda, would come in every morning before and after dropping her kids at school, around lunchtime sometimes, actually buying us lunch. In the evening, when her husband was home too... She came for hours, considering she lived a couple of streets over. She was very nice, and I started to enjoy her visits. We all got along so well at that store. It was a really fun atmosphere for the most part. It was finally time for me to start working the night shift, though. I had my manager with me for a few nights. I was taking her place on night shift, because she couldn't do it anymore. I thought she was nice, and I admit I did have a pretty big crush on her as well, so I didn't mind spending the time with her all night. I learned that when she worked the night shift, Melinda would spend the entire night there. I had been working the night shift alone for a couple of weeks at this point, and some of those night shift drug on into the days when we were short-staffed. 
Again, I really needed the money, though. One night, I was doing my chores, scrubbing the hot dog rollers, setting the coffee filters up for the rush, and mopping the entire store. While emptying my mop bucket, I heard the chime on the door. I looked at my watch and saw it was around 2 a.m. I was on. There wasn't typically anyone coming into the store until 4 o'clock consistently. I was a little upset because I had just mopped the floor. I went out to see who it was. Just as I headed out, the movement in the mirror overhead to stop shoplifters caught my eye. There was a man at the counter doing something with the money order machine. Upon looking closer, he had a knife on him. He seemed to be cutting all the wires. For what reason, I have no clue. While he was cutting, I heard him muttering, Where's Bonka? Over and over again. I knew I could walk back and get to the phone in the office, but I didn't want him to hear me moving. I pulled my personal cell out and texted Melinda to call the cops. I tried to text quickly as much of the situation as I could describe. She told me she would be right down there. I was freaking out with every second that passed by. Before she could get there, the man stormed outside to the gas pumps. He began throwing the trash cans everywhere and started to try and cut through the gas lines with his knife. I took the opportunity to lock the front door, just in case he tried to get back in. Thank God I did, because as soon as he noticed me, he immediately made a beeline to the door and started jabbing his knife into it. Just as he did, the cops and Melinda showed up. He was arrested and put into the cop car, while I explained everything that had just happened. Turns out Bonka was the name of my manager, whose name was Bianca. Apparently, this guy had become obsessed with her in the weeks prior, dropping in nightly and making her very uncomfortable, which explains why she wanted to replace me with the night shift. They knowingly threw me into this mess, and seeing me there instead of her was what turned his obsession into rage. The man became extremely unhinged that he could no longer see Bianca, and decided to try and take that out in the gas station, and I guess me as well.